Nicole, um, Nicole called me on, I think, Tuesday of this week and said, hey, can you be in New York on Friday? And I said, ha, ha. <laughs> oh my goodness. Sure, yes, absolutely, I'll make it. And so I'm sleepy, but we're good. Okay, so uh, we, can switch over, uh, we, can, we can switch over to my settings pane. I just, uh, let's see, I just tweeted this deck, so you should go get it. That's, I'm at Colin McGill, C-O-L-I-N-M-E-G-I-L-L. -L. And there are lots of examples at the end that we will play with and that you can hack on so that you can see for yourself what this is all about. This... This is, I, I couldn't, I really could not be more excited to have made it. Um, I'm from Seattle. Uh, I'm from a startup called Polis, P-O-L dot I-S. Uh, and I'm from a, uh, a shop called Formidable Labs that builds a lot of uh, Walmart.com's critical infrastructure. I don't work on that project, but I work on others. So there's a lot of concentrated web knowledge. I lead teams, and I lead teams on really complicated client-side web apps. I'm mostly in JavaScript all day. And I, I am obsessed with web-based data visualizations and interactive, interactive data in general. Work with a lot of data scientists. Really love, really love shareability, filterability, sortability. And a lot of these, a lot of these patterns are going to come up. A lot of patterns that I've learned in interactive data visualizations will come up in this talk. So without any further ado, let's, let's, uh, let's do it. Okay, so if I was here to announce that SAS had been integrated into the browser, this would be a much warmer reception. I'm not. But if I were, and if I said, hey, you don't have to compile to static CSS anymore. You can keep your variables and change them at any time, recompute your whole app anytime. You can keep your functions. They, you can recompute those at any time, too. You can keep your modules. You don't have to have globals if you don't want to. We would be very excited, as Kira Knightley is. But I think it's going to be more like it's going to be more like this. And I don't know. I still, I, I, at a gut level, at a gut level, I know that this is the right gif. I still don't know whether I'm the panda or you are the panda. We'll find out <laughs> during this talk. So we know that CSS, vanilla CSS, is not is not where it's at. Right, that, that hasn't been hipster since like 20, 2007, right? We, we've been using, we've been, we, I, I started out in, in vanilla CSS, and then I went to, I, then I went to uh, Bootstrap, and then I did less, with, I would just like downloaded Bootstrap and use it, then I went like less with Bootstrap, then I went like SAS with Bootstrap, then I like ditched Bootstrap and just used SAS, and then, and then you know, then I ditched SAS and CSS and just used inline styles. So the, I, I mean, I feel like I've been on a similar progression to all of you. I really, it, it really resonated with me, with me um, what Ada Kunles, uh, I did write that down. Uh, where are you? That was great. Yeah, your talk was great. It really resonated with me. I mean, I feel like we're on a similar journey here back, back to code, right? So, okay. So things have changed since, uh, since 1998. The ecosystem is way better. Uh, we do things differently. Declarative is not an asset anymore. Declarative is a liability. CSS is a liability, and that's, that's really the core of what I'm, I'm here to say, and that there are now way better ways to solve things with JS. And the ecosystem has changed in the following ways. In 1998, we had a bunch of HTML files, and you had to go through them, and you had to change things by hand or script that if you wanted to change styles. It was an appropriate abstraction to have a declarative style sheet. Um, the, uh, the, the, um, the, the being able to, to abstract everything and have variables was helpful, but really the declarative selector-based model was, was, came about at a much... Um, a much simpler time in what we were asking the DOM to do and what we were asking the web to do, and in terms of what interactivity we were expecting. Now we have, have play.spotify.com, right? We have Spotify on the web and streaming and overlays and clicking and all sorts of state and multiple paned music players that we're still asking that same kind of professor web page DOM to give us. We can require things. We have, we, have, uh, we have modules. We have NPM. We can share JavaScript. And we have immediate mode UIs. I won't go, uh, we're going to come back to that. So just remember that word, and we'll be back there in a second. CSS is causing problems. Um, the, the long and short of this is that declarative is not great for interactivity. 
uh, what we have to do is we have to create classes semantically and then grab them with JavaScript and take them, take them on and off the DOM. And you remove the class, and you add the class, remove the class, add the class, remove the class, add the class. And the more complicated that gets, the more impetus there is to move more logic into CSS and to do more if effectively more if statements in CSS. But that, that has diminishing returns because we can't pull all of the logic of our applications into CSS. And now, um, I'm looking at you, Atomic CSS. The medicine is now worse than the disease because now we're creating these, these, these massive, uh, uh, you know, like semantic frameworks to try to handle the complexity of, um, of, of, the, uh, of, of what CSS has become. So, so if, we change, like if we change state anywhere in our application, we expect styles to be changed. Our, our bosses say things like, or our, our clients say things like, Hey, um, okay, so if this user isn't authenticated, yeah, don't show that stuff. Or uh, that should be, or this is on this device, or on Android, it doesn't support that, so make sure that you're showing the other thing. Or, uh, you know, we, we have, or when you, when you load this, if it loads incorrectly, then this pane needs to change. The conditionals just keep piling on. That's never going to stop. And so, really, at, at the heart of this, we need computation. And that's what this is, that's what this is about. This is about recomputing styles. This is about computed styles. This is about recomputed styles. Every time any data changes in your application, you may need to recompute your entire style sheet in response to that. And that's really what, at the, at the essence, using inline styles is about. So, I love D3. I have been using D3 for, I've been using D3 for years. And I was using D3 because I was building interactive data visualizations. At the same time, I was building all of these complex app behaviors that are just in normal CRUD apps, the login, the settings pane, the blah, blah, blah. Um, so what is it, what is it about this that was just so compelling? And I was using these two things side by side. Every time my data changed, and this is an immediate mode AI, uh, UI, every time the data changes, you re-render. So every time my data changed, I got to re-render and I got to pass my markup through this chain of functions. and d dot foo equals bar, so I could check. I could say like, hey, if this, let's say I have 10 circles, and if they're, hey, if they're an even number, if it's 0, 2, 4, uh, 6, or 8, then you know, make those red, make the, uh, make the odds blue. I, I, could, I, had, I could use Lodash, and I could reach in there uh, d deep into to an object and say, hey, uh, this, this object has a certain property or key value pair, and I, I want it to look like this because of that. You can do really, really deep, much, much, much deeper than, than you know, nth child kind of. You can do nth child too in JavaScript, but it, because it's just like check the index of the array. But it, this, this was so, so compelling, and I, I just kind of, it was unconscious though. I had it in the back of my mind, and it really wasn't until it wasn't until I saw React, and it wasn't until I saw Christopher Shadow talk on uh, CSS in JS that it really, un like, it really popped into my into my mind where this all was going, and where this is all going is that we're gonna we're gonna keep the styles, but we're gonna ditch the cascade and we're gonna ditch the sheets, and the the reason is that if we recompute the entire application every single time uh, our data changes, what we end up with um, is computation on the client. We end up with this. And I can tell you, we're building major client applications like this. Once you have functions, it's, it's, very, hard, it's very hard to, to contemplate going back. Why, why can we do this? Compute padding and pass in some state, whatever you want. What, what, in what circumstance can we do this? Well, we can do this if our inline style is a compile target. If we take an object, put it all together, and put it onto, and, and, and aim it at a style tag. We can, we can, we can compute every time, the, uh, every time the application changes. And again, I'm talking about, specifically, these examples will all be with React, because it's, a, because it's, the, it's, it's the best example of, 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 this, uh, of this right now. You could do the same, you could do all these examples in D3, but that's, that's less specific, it's, it's more specific to SVG than it is to the DOM, React is general. So, where you cannot do this is in a class. Uh, CSS classes, defining a CSS class does not allow you to do a ternary because you, you just, it's, it simply won't run, right? It's CSS, it's not, it's not meant for that. And doing this with jQuery is a pain. If you, want, uh, if you want to do this with listeners or if you want to do this in, same thing with, um, with event binding in Backbone, if you want to do this, you would need to attach an event listener like click or change or on and uh, on, uh, um, on, on hover, things like that. And then you would need to, um, you need to, to, uh, to, to change the CSS in response to data changes. And this is a lot of what we've been doing in Backbone. Uh, you, you have a, a change in, uh, in a model or you have a change in the data somewhere and that fires off some view method and the view method changes the, the DOM. And 
to do to, uh, to recompute all of these styles every single time and to only work like this would be really, really belaborous. But I'm going to show you how to do it how, in React. It's, it's, not, it's not bad anymore. It's, it's just fine to do this. This solves just about everything about the complexity of mobile, web, mobile, uh, mobile responsive web applications, which can run into the, uh, how many people here have been in a CSS uh, code base that has m m more than, m around or more than 10,000 lines of CSS? <laughs> yeah, totally, me too. So, so the, the, the complexity of that, and how many of you, for those of you, for those of you who raise your hands, how many of you are handling that mostly with naming conventions? Yeah. That's uh, so about, uh, about you know, two-thirds of the same people, right? The best thing we have right now is make sure that you're namespacing to your views or ma make, sure that you're using, make sure that you're using naming conventions and make sure that you're using these uh, this kind of, kind of CSS best practices. Um, but it still becomes a mess over time because when you look at a style sheet, it's not clear what state may lead to that class being applied to the DOM. It's a small research project to figure that out. And that can be very hard to tell whether you're changing someone's code, whether it's going to... Um, whether it's going to update the right thing or not. If you're using computation, we're talking computation with properties. Right? If a property changes, uh, or if you, if you re-render, you you're going back to check uh, some property. You can require a JavaScript module, and glo globals, globals dot border radius small. And this is just a big file, right? It's a big, it's a big, it's a big, it's a big object. Just like you would have your, your SAS variables, you would have a big, uh, a big object of JavaScript variables, and it would be get border radius small or, 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 or dot, uh, you know, sans serif. And you would have all of these variables and you could recompute them. You could change them anytime, not just before, not just when you compile. You can, you can do that anytime if you're using JavaScript. So computation with functions. Uh, you could say, hey, the width, the width should be computed and you could get access to the window. So you can, uh, well, I'm going to show you an example with this in just a moment. We're gonna, there's a, an example called molten, molten letting, uh, which is, uh, if you've ever seen, has anybody ever seen that? Where you, you know, you've got like the, the, the line height is a function of something else. Um, hard to do, but not with this. Uh, having, having a ternary. Right, you can check check a condition, check a global condition, and ha and then and then and then set padding. Um, check the uh, check a check a global flag, check a boolean, and 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 set and set a setting. Uh, think SAS, but with access to everything that JS knows and not compiled to a declarative syntax, not compiled to CSS, not to, to, to compiled to a declarative language, compiled, not compiled just variables, just in the JavaScript runtime. We would still have modularization. And this is what I say when I say the ecosystem has changed. Many of the things we couldn't do with, with many of the things we couldn't do before we can do now. We can modularize the same way we do with SAS. We would just modularize but use objects instead. So let's take a look, um, uh, let's take a look at, um, uh, at, at some, of the, some of the edge cases. One of the first immediate objections is, well, OK, but that's not going to handle hover. That's not going to handle any of the pseudo elements. And the truth is you can do those with JS event listeners. And we built, our, our shop built Radium. And there's actually like seven others that have already come out uh, besides Radium to handle all of these edge cases and, and do them with JavaScript event listeners. And the performance, anecdotally, the performance is blazing fast. There's no issue whatsoever. Uh, and like I said, you can do things like, you can use Lodash. Has anyone here used you, Lodash or underscore? Great. Okay. Yeah. Great. Okay. Great. So, uh, you being able to use Lodash and underscore to check to, to to check the value of an object before you apply padding to it, that's really powerful. It's complete. It's as expressive as you could as you could imagine. So the um, one of the other problems, of course, is that uh, is that with with CSS, as we have these ten thousand uh, th these ten ten thousand plus uh, line CSS files. A developer, a developer recently said in a project I was working on, well, it's like I have my button and I just need to be in front of everyone else's CSS and just make this wall so that I know that I'm in front of everyone else's globals. And it's like, well, that's, that is a problem in a big project. We have all of these globals that are, that are affecting your button. What, with this, if you don't apply anything to it, you would end up with an HTML button, a completely unstyled button, because everything would be scoped to modules and you would just add things as you needed them. So what does this mean? It means that CSS is pretty over. It's been pretty over for a while, and that's why we're using SAS. The suggestion here is that SAS is a kind of coming home to logic, but that logic is JavaScript. So <laughs> that, that's, 
that's the, well, I'm, now I'm going to show you, I promise. Um, and I know what you're saying. Um, because, because, you know, when you, it's very, it's natural, right? It's natural. This is a radical idea. And this is a, this is a radical departure. It basically is the, the we've, we've been building up a lot of best practices around this language. And I'm saying that they're, um, they're I'm sorry. Um, it's, it's, uh, there, there is now a better way. And I, I have, uh, I, I think this is going to be a tectonic shift in the way that we build web applications because it's going to handle state in a way that we have hitherto never been able to, to contemplate handling state in complex web applications. Do, ke do keep in mind that my bent, of course, is coming from really large, uh, complex client side applications and interactive data visualizations. That's my tool chain. That's what I love. I want it to be really expressive. So, you know, I, I, I don't build static e commerce pages, and, and there's nothing wrong with those. But even those, I have to say, many, many people is switch to SAS. Why? Because you have variables, right? And there's still state there. So, okay, let's look at some examples. So, um, I'm going to ask you guys to go ahead and look at these on your, uh, your computer as well, if you have it. Um, you, I tweeted this link out to the, to the presentation. Um, I'm going to pop out of here and, uh, and, just show you, um, and just show you these. So, let's see. So, the first one is state. So, let me show you, um, let me show you what this does. So, I'm going to type into this, and I'm going to say, um, this paragraph is blue. And this paragraph is 72 pixels. And then I'm going to say this, this paragraph is pink. And I'm going to say this paragraph is yellow. And so this is reactive. When I'm, when I'm changing the state of the application, the styles are just recomputing. And you have to, do, uh, make, you have to make the next you know, thousand jumps to get to your own web application, which is, OK, wait a second. What are the states that we have? And how do our styles change in response to that? And how many times are we duplicating classes to try to create these different states in classes and in sets of namespace classes? Right. So let's take a look at the code that makes this happen. Um, the code that makes this happen, uh, code that makes this happen looks like this. So this is React. Um, OK, hold on. Uh, let me just pull this over. So we have an on change. Um, oh, God, Adam, come on. OK. Um, I love you, but all right. Control zero. Control, is, that what I, is that what I want? Control zero, command zero? All right, that's okay. Hold on. There we go. I just just minus, but that doesn't help you guys because now you can't see it. Um, all right. So, we uh, anyone seen React before? Fantastic. Okay. Well, then you're going to be really excited because this is this works with what you're already using. So. Down here, we, we just define a paragraph, and we say this paragraph is this.state.color and this.state.font size. So we're just, putting the, uh, we're just putting those variables in there, and we're simply setting style to this.state.color, this.state.font size. So this is like the simplest start here. Uh, and then we, we have the input fire functions. So when the inputs fire functions, they set state to target.value, and so they'll set state to yellow and blue and, and 72. And uh, when we, when we change them, and we say pink, or we say blue, our styles change reactively, or 36, right? OK, so now um, let's take a look at a different one. And let's go to, uh, let's go to that molten, molten, uh, molten letting example. So we start out with uh, an initial line height of 1.5 and a, a font size of 14. So what we're going to do is we have this big paragraph down here. And the line height is this.state.line height. And this.state.line height starts out at 1.5, but we, when component did mount, when, the, when, the, when it goes into the DOM, we call, um, we call get line height. And get line height finds the paragraph um, and then uh, feeds it to get computed style. So it finds out how wide it is. And then it, uh, it does set state uh, line height parse int divided by 300. So we are getting the width of the paragraph and then dividing that by 300 and setting that to the, um, and setting that to the, uh, the, the, the value for line height. And what that means is that we get dynamically computed and recomputed line height every time we, we change our window. If we scroll, if we, if, we, uh, if we make it more expansive, obviously we need more complex math in there to make this actually look good. It's just a simple, this is the simplest possible example. But Every time, because we have an event listener on our window, every time we, we move the window down, we recompute our line height. And we recompute our line height. Our line height is a function of the width of the paragraph. So that's, uh, that's, that's the function example, as per before. Um, OK, let's see. Uh, next example is a, um, 
let's see. Okay, next example is Ajax. So this is a, a little mock uh, API uh, call. Font, for, font family courier, font size 72, color blue. So we're going to take a look at we're going to take a look at this. You can see here we have a little slider. Once again, this set state, so we can just dynamically change our font size and and make that uh, make it zoom up and down. Um, it's like a that's like a couple lines of code. Um, uh, not terribly useful, but also demonstrates changing state. So what's really interesting is that we're going to make an AJAX call. We're going to make a get to this API endpoint. We're going to get back some data, and then we're going to uh, we're going to change the state of our application, and we're going to change the state of the application from the defaults, which are red and like 16 pixels, to what came back in the in the response. So if I click AJAX, and if the Wi-Fi works, there you go. So when it came back, it set the state of the application. What does this mean? What this means is that if you loaded up a widget in an iframe, take this example. Let's say that you design a widget. Anyone ever been asked to, to design something that was, that was themable? And, you know, and your boss was like, just make it so that it'll look like whatever page the person, you know, you know, they have their stuff, they have their colors, right? And just, just you'll just make it like whatever theirs is, and, or so that, so that they can make it whatever like theirs is. And you're like, ha, 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 ha Bill, <laughs> right? Like that's gonna be that's gonna be weeks because uh, it is not simple for them. What am I gonna have? I'm gonna give them have them like load a different style sheet asynchronously. Try this. You have an iframe and you have a bunch of data attributes and you have a script tag and you post message inside the inside the iframe and pass in an object. That's all. So you pass in an object inside of that iframe, and you set that to your variables uh, file. So you swap out your variables file for their variables file, all their fonts, all their colors, all their sizes, all their pa default paddings. And you can just recompute your, your app while it's in the browser on the fly in response to like a, a, you know, a, a post message. That's the, that's the idea. Recompute anything, anytime in response to any state. So next example, these, um, these are the simpler ones. Uh, these are more um, just for you to get in and play with and hack around. They're in gists, so you can copy this gist. You can find the gist, copy the gist, um, get it onto your desktop and just start hacking with it and playing with it. These are a little bit more complicated, but they're also linked to there. And these are thanks to Ken Wheeler, um, who, uh, who helped out with these. This is, this is SVG. Uh, this is generating random values and using, uh, using tween state. So these is, this is React. Um, this is React and JavaScript animations to tween these values. Um, so is uh, so is this. This is a filter list done with done with tweening. When you filter children, they transition smoothly to their new position, and that's pretty hard with CSS. But this is this is in the DOM. This isn't SVG or anything. These are DOM elements transitioning to new positions. Um, because you can tween, uh, you can basically what he's doing is he's making a clone of each of these elements and then um, tweening them, getting the absolute position, getting the absolute position of where they're going, tweening them to that new state and fading in and fading out the, right, the, the, the correct ones. And so you can see that that creates a nice smooth animation. That's a little bit complicated except that it's a React component. What's that mean is that, well, you can just take that component, put your children inside of that component, and then... Um, and then don't put your children inside of components. Not kind. Um, just put the children inside of components, and then and then just allow that uh, uh, allow the component to to do it, to do the magic. Uh, so passing these things around inside of a company or just in the open source community in, in npm modules really nice because you can not only you don't have to pass around a style sheet for this or have uh, you can just pass around a component that happens to do all of its computed styling internally. And that, that's also very powerful in terms of sharing experiences, not just sharing, not just sharing like, hey, I got this to look this way, or hey, hey, here's how I did this in my app in these conditions. If you can share a component and that component handles its styling, then you can then you can share you can you can share experiences like this and just allow someone else to pick this right up. And I mean I could you could probably get this working in your app in less than an hour. Um, and that's 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 pretty powerful for complex behavior. Um, the last thing uh, this is the um, this is the CSS website. This is um, Radium handling uh, complex keyframe animations. Oh my goodness! I'm so sorry. I need just a second here because this is. Uh, I think I'm gonna have to go full screen and then go to editor, go to presentation. No. <laughs> Whose site is this? What are you? No, sorry. <laughs> okay. Uh, full page. <laughs> okay. So. 
This is a uh, radium. This is um, JavaScript. This is an iframe inside of inside of a, uh, a div, which is animating um, uh, with with uh, with keyframe animations in radium. Um, this is all JavaScript uh, animations, and you can see the responsive. Um, this is the actual site, so it's it's res responsively. Um, here you can see we can click on something in here and and see that it actually works. That's the, that's the yeah. So anyway, um, so uh, let me come out of this. So. I, um, I wanted to end with 15 minutes because I figured there actually would be a lot of questions. I, 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 I know they, they told me not to take questions, but I, I just I want to. So, um, <laughs> so I'm sorry, Nicole. Um, you think you are? <laughs> so uh, I am I am happy to I'm happy to answer any questions. Anyone anybody want to anybody want to go? Yeah. Are you suggesting no style sheets at all, or is this still? We are not shipping any CSS. I think, though, that there is a place for CSS. Um, in Radium, for instance, you can define a scope style tag and put like a CSS animation in there. I think there are some. I, I think that the amount of CSS that would be useful would fit inside of the uh, of like a, a style tag in the head of like an, an HTML template that's an entry point to your whole app. Things like styling normalize or styling um, styling body, things like that. I, I think are, uh, or if, if you're if you are. Um, you could certainly style body with with, uh, uh, but but if you if you have if you do want every paragraph to look a certain way, there's no reason not to use globals. But globals are maybe they may be appropriate for. I'm thinking probably less than five percent of what you'll do with this will be actually in CSS itself, and the rest will be scoped to the elements themselves, so that you can recompute anytime you want. Yeah. Sure. Bit of sure. Um, is there any way to make the difference between the two? Or is there a point to make the Yeah, I think that one of the great one of the one of a really good reason to make this shift would be that you could take that button, that button would own in, in and I'm talking about React. Uh, but in, just, just in general, Angular is doing a, doing a full rewrite, and their DOM model is going to look a lot like React. So this is this is this is the direction of things. I I, I think being able to share a behavior. If you write a, if you write a button, and it's a great button, and it has a wonderful little spinner, and it has all of its CSS, all of its styles, shoot, uh, all of its styles contained inside of itself, uh, then you could. Put that button on npm and have, or private npm, and have your coworkers download that button. Here's another example of why of why um, you might want to do this. Uh, so if you are in component uh, playground, so one of the things that um, one of the things that our shop uh, put out was this thing called component playground, and component playground. It's going to take a second to load. So this is um, this is dynamically uh, generated. So so I'm sorry, it's, it's like dynamically. This is all computed. This is uh, this is re this is React. So if you if you say min min width ah, um, min width is 400, so you can change the button. And if you have you can have a style guide for your company that is not only a style sheet with static things, but you can have a style sheet with behaviors. So even that button might hover or change in different states, or have a loading state with a with a spinner. You could bundle that spinner logic up inside of that button and just ship that as a component, and then have um, have all of that. Scoped to uh, like a single npm install, npm install button, or npm install like like our like pivotal dash you know pivotal dash styles dash button, and then you just require pivotal dash styles dash button, and then it would it would just load that up, um, and 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 you would pass in whatever you wanted to in props or not, and uh, it would have default behaviors that could be overridden, um, but even in buttons, I mean take take a look at you know even for a button for ne now in a, in a, in, a, in a web application like take take Twitter. Um, the uh, let's see. Um, look at this. Uh, I mean, when you when you click here, this button has state, and it has. But this 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 it, this button has state related to that form field, and so even even the lowly button in web, in in web applications can can be quite quite complicated given the given 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 loading and given permissions whether it should be there or not uh, a single a single button if you if you're not logged in won't be there if you if it's if you're if you haven't typed anything it's gray um, if you if it's gone over too long then it's gray again um, so i think there there really there really is everywhere you look you find state now and uh, i think that's 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 my primary motivation for all of this 
Say again? Why can you ship CSS files in NPM? Uh, wh why can you ship CSS files? Why can't you? Oh, why can't you? Yeah. Nothing to stop you from doing that. But the point is that uh, CSS allows you to, uh, to share your component. Yep. You can do it with CSS too. Yeah. Yeah, you can. <laughs> if you're sharing a style sheet, how would you share state? Mm -hmm. Right, but if you then need jQuery or an, or other JavaScript to add and remove classes, diff, given different application state, that's that's where that breaks down, because you end up with you end up with with a, a style sheet that has states that are implicit but not explicit. It's not explicit when one of these style sheets would be applied or not. If I handed you if I hand you a component and everything in that component is logic then you can see when that will be and when that will not be applied. If I hand you a style sheet and no JavaScript that, that puts the, 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 the styles into and out of the DOM. Why can you uh, open React style or open React component yeah. without template? Yes. Uh -huh. See uh, when you apply some button, like is disabled, is explicit too. Yeah, yeah. Um, but, but. If you, you, if you do that, that's back to one of my earlier slides. Um, if you do that, you lose. You lose, you, you, you can't do this. You, you, cannot, you cannot do computation. And that's what, that's what I'm after. I'm after, I'm after computation. What's that? This is not computation. You have only two states. It's like a small, small variant and big variant. It's... Or you foo, put two parens after foo like I did in the other examples, and then you and then pass a, pass an argument into it, and then have a module that, that checks eighteen other things, makes six API calls, and then comes back. That's computation. So I mean, like it's it's a simplified example, but but you can't do that. You cannot do that in a CSS file. So putting this class on something in a, in in a React element and then having an external style sheet does not does not solve the computation problem. That's that's at the core of this. Yeah. yeah. Go ahead. Yep. Yep. Great question. So with React, you can do server-side rendering of a web application, and so you can you can uh, bootstrap the data you need, put everything into a, a single string, no classes, no CSS, just put everything into HTML and ship it over, and it'll it'll be workable. And then you can you can you can have the clicks go back to the uh, back to the server and load another page. So you, this this would all work without uh, this would all work with just server-side rendering as well. That would be the, yeah. Uh, go ahead. What are the insights about performance? I'm thinking specifically about like, the CSS animations that someone can Yeah. They do. Um, they do. So JavaScript, JavaScript's gotten way faster in the browser. We've been, we've been I, I, some of the stuff that I showed you uh, we, we've, that we've been working with, the, the examples of the transitions, tweening, tweening tens of things on the page, performant. Uh, adding lots of listeners performant. We haven't hit a lot of barriers. Some of our initial tests suggest that looping over the DOM with com very complex CSS selectors can get very slow, whereas when you're styling the element in particular, that's going to be faster. Uh, so we, because the, because the styles are applied directly to the element, but we do not have, I would be lying to you if I told you that the, per the perf story is completely nailed down on this. This is, this is really new, and we don't have, we don't know in which cases it's going to be vastly better or vastly worse. Um, I, we have not run into any issues, and we're shipping this on big stuff, so uh, I, I, we're, I'm, I'm not, not concerned. Yeah. Sure. So in this case, um, you might have. Uh, have you, do you use SAS now? Yeah. So do you have a variables.scss file? Yeah. No different. So you would have a, you would have an object, and you would do module.exports glo module.exports equals globals, and you would have a glo var globals equals and a big object of all of your colors and stuff like that. And then in your component, you would just do require globals 
and then just refer to that global. So you can, you don't, you, there, you don't need to necessarily, sorry about that, you don't need to necessarily, I was just gonna eat the microphone because I'm really hungry. Um, you don't need to, uh, you don't need to reference something inside of the component just because you're doing inline styles. Your styles can be distributed in whatever modular way you want them to be, and they can be, they can, there can be many smaller objects which you're running JavaScript on to compute larger objects. So there's no, you know, even, even in that globals file, you could reference other files there that have logic that, for instance, maybe you want that globals file, that global variable file, to be, to, maybe you want your, your default padding to be, uh, or your default paragraph padding to be a function of whether you, of, of your device, so or your or your or your width. So in that case, you would um, you would just use the you would use you would use computation there to check device or width, and then uh, and then and then and then compute what your globals are, and then reference the globals in the component itself. Does that make sense? SAS is correct, but SAS compiling to CSS is wrong. Ha, ha, ha.